Good morning, everybody. This is Russell Sturm. I am going to be serving as the, the facilitator of this conversation today. Um, you have reached the Welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short, uh, webinar. Uh, it's part of the E4C's 2014 webinar series. And today we have what I find to be a fascinating subject. It's the area I work in. Uh, and uh, we at IFC, Russell Sturm, and the E4C webinar series have been working together with three leaders of the off-grid solar industry to put together um, a conversation about dynamics in the market today and key issues surrounding it. Um, the, this is a collaboration of Gaurav Manchanda, who's the CEO of One Degree Solar, Dr. Harold Schutzeischel, founder and director of SunConnect EG, and Ned Tozen, who's the president and founder of D-Light. I'm Russell Sturm. I lead IFC, the International Finance Corporation's energy access work. And IFC is part of the World Bank Group. We're the part of the, of the World Bank Group that invests in the private sector. So we share the World Bank's mission of eliminating poverty to improve people's lives, but the way we do it is through private sector development. So I'd like us to slide over to slide two if we can. So the conversation today um, reflects a key area of E4C's work, um, because E4C is always looking to share insights and developments from a technological standpoint, from a business model standpoint, that shape the model, the market. Um, our presenters today are all pioneers in the off-grid solar sector. So I, I think we're blessed to have this crew together in one space, one virtual space. Um, but at first, I'd like to take a moment to recognize the coordinators of the E4C webinar series generally. Uh, Jana Aranda and Mike Madere of, of ASME, Holly Schneider-Brown and Steve Welch of IEEE, who they both work on developing and delivering this webinar series that we're a part of. So thank you guys for helping to put this thing together, for putting it together. So if anybody has any questions about the series itself, these are the people to go to. And they're always interested in future topics and ideas for future speakers. You can see the email address for them at the top of the Engineering for Change website, which is engineeringforchange.org. So I'm going to um, ask Jana, uh, one of the organizers of the series, um, to uh, talk a little bit about E4C and how the series fits into it. Jana? Thank you, Russell. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending where you're joining us from today. Um, before we move on to our presenters, we thought it would be a great idea to remind you about E4C and who we are. We are a global community of over 20,700 technically minded members and more than 200,000 social media followers such as engineers, technologists, NGO representatives, social scientists, and others who work together to solve critical humanitarian challenges faced by underserved communities around the world today. Some examples include access to potable water, off-grid energy, which is the subject of today's webinar, effective healthcare, agriculture, sanitation, and other areas. We invite you to join E4C by becoming a member. E4C membership provides cost-free access to a growing inventory, a field-tested solution, and related information from all the members of our coalition, including professional societies such as ASME, IEEE, ASCE, WE, and ASHRAE, as well as academic supporters such as MIT's eLab, international development agencies like USAID, Engineers Without Borders USA, and Practical Action, as well as access to a passionate, engaged community working to make people's lives better all over the world. Registration is easy, and it's free. Check out our website, engineeringforchange.org, to learn more and sign up. The webinar you're participating in today is one installment of the Engineering for Change webinar series. This free, publicly available series of online seminars showcases the best practices and thinking of leaders in the field to bring innovative ideas and technology to bear on the global development challenges. Information about upcoming installments in the series and archived videos of past presentations 
can be found on the E4C webinars page. You can see the URL listed right here. Additionally, you can find uh, webinar videos uh, on our YouTube channel, so we encourage you to check that out as well. If you're following us on Twitter today, I'd personally like to invite you to join the conversation with our dedicated hashtag, uh, E4C webinars. It's listed here in orange. Our next webinar will be on August 19th at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time with Dr. Patrick Meyer, who is the Director of Social Innovation at QCRI and a really recognized personality. Dr. Meyer will be speaking about humanitarians in the sky, how UAVs are changing disaster response. Uh, we believe that's going to be a very interesting and exciting webinar and encourage you all to register. Just check out the E4C webinars page uh, for updates and registration um, right there. If you're already an E4C member, we will be sending you an invitation to the webinar directly. So I'm going to hand it over back to Russell now. Thank you, Yana. So there's um, just a little bit of a guidance here uh, about, um, about how this is going to work today. Um, a few housekeeping items around it. Uh, you know, I think what we want to do is go to the next slide if we can, seven. Yes, there we go. Okay. So this is how we're navigating around this today. So you see slide seven in front of you. We've got a few functions here that you can move between. Um, one of them is the group chat, which you see in the top left-hand corner. Um, during the course of the webinar, you can use this to type in any sort of remarks you have and interact with your fellow attendees. Now, I understand there's over 400 people that have registered for this. I don't know how many are online, but if you would please go into the group chat and type your location. This gives us a sense of the community that's participating in this, and it allows folks to uh, interact. There's 100 people now online. We expect others to join over the course of it. So if you would please go into the group chat sometime early in the presentation, ideally now, and identify your location. Uh, additionally, you'll see there's a Q&A window where you can type questions that go directly to the presenters. So the group chat is among the, the participants broadly. The Q&A is the questions that I will be looking at to see if, which ones we can queue up, which ones we have time for that support the flow of the conversation after the formal presentation. Um, and then there's a help widget that you can see, and that's if you have technical issues, and we've got several folks on board that are keeping an eye on this. I see so far we've got participants from Mexico, India, US, Canada so far, among others. So after the webinar, you'll also see uh, if you go to, um, if you're trying to get a certificate of completion to meet your professional development uh, requirements and get credit for this, if you go to the top of the website for Engineering for Change, there's information there about how to get credit for this after it's over. We've also been joined now by Germany, South Africa, and Tanzania. So finally on that page, if you would please go to the survey. I think we want to go back to seven for that. Thank you. The survey in the bottom right-hand corner. This helps, um, helps us all to figure out how better to communicate, uh, what worked, what didn't work, so that this series can get better and better, and the participants can learn and figure out better how to communicate our thoughts and our ideas. So I'm the moderator, Russell Sturm. Um, I've mentioned that I uh, lead IFC's um, energy access work. We focus on private sector solutions for economic development, and I've worked in the energy field for seemingly ever, um, about 30 years or more, um, originally working in the U.S. market with energy efficiency. I have a recurrent theme throughout my career of how you mobilize financing to make investments happen which make sense on economic and development grounds. After running an energy services company in the United States, I started working internationally um, at the International Institute for Energy Conservation where I became the president um, for work there for seven years. 
and decided that the platform that would work best for me was IFC. It was a nice convergence of the ability to think about markets, mobilize resources, aggregate people. So I've had a career where I think a lot about how you accelerate uptake of new technology that has economic, environmental, developmental benefits, how you address barriers to uptake of advantageous technologies, and how you mobilize the capital needed to make good ideas happen. And that's the work I continue to do here at IFC. I, I have been engaged with the off-grid lighting sector and the solar sector for the last, really, in different ways, 15 years, but more directly with the development of the Lighting Africa program and now Lighting Global, Lighting Asia, which I lead, which work I lead at IFC, over the last six years, five years or so. In this work, I've come to know, know the, my fellow panelists as pioneers in the space. Ned Tozen, um, who has a background going back where he was thinking about media technology. He was thinking about how you take technology and develop products and expand markets using initially mobile content, uh, working in developed markets. And when he went back to graduate school at Stanford in business, he started thinking more about how transformative such technologies can be in the developing world and how you bring the principles of business as a basis for scaling access to energy. I met Ned when he was in graduate school, before D-Light was just an idea in his head, and he became the co-founder and now president of D-Light, which he founded with Sam Goldman um, ever since. D-Light is the acknowledged, undisputed leader of the off-grid lighting sector, and he will be talking not just about D-Light, but also about the whole, can, he'll be laying down a contextual framework for our conversation today, talking about the energy access challenge, the limitations of traditional grid-connected power for much of the developing world, and um, talking about how D-Light has been able to generate actually a tremendous impact on fully commercial bases and the direction that he sees the industry and his company going in that context. He'll be followed in the conversation by Gaurav Vanchanta. Gaurav is the CEO of One Degree Solar, which has a different niche in the market. Um, Gaurav comes at this from his work in Western Africa, working in the health sector. He was working at the Clinton Foundation, um, where in that context, from the inside, he was seeing the, the shackles of lack of energy access on an economy, on people's lives, and the health impacts of it. And from starting from the basis of trying to figure out how to ha help his health sector clients and counterparts access the energy they need to keep vaccines cold, to light operating rooms, to, to function, what emerged from that was his ideas around one degree solar. And now, in a commercial basis, he is seeking to scale and deliver energy access through the proprietary technology and business model of one degree solar. Finally, we'll be joined by Harold Schutzeichel. Harold has been, I would say, a serial entrepreneur and innovator. He has deep background in the solar industry as one of the pioneers of the German solar sector, going back to 98 with Solarstrom. Uh, and now he is applying his ideology, his ethics, his business expertise, and his technical expertise uh, to a trio of interlinked um, organizations, Solar Energy Foundation, Sun Transfer, and Sun Connect, which operate across the spectrum of of commercial, for-profit, not-for-profit foundation as a way to leverage various pieces of the continuum to achieve energy access at the highest level. So we're honored to have these three experts with us, people that have put their own money on the line to live 
a dream of scaling up access for the 1.2, 1.3 billion people without access to basic energy services in the planet. And I will hand the, the um, modem the, and the mouse over to my friend Ned Tozen from DLight. Great. Thanks so much, Russell, for the very generous introduction. And thanks to all of you for attending and participating. I'm really uh, impressed by the, the turnout. It's really exciting uh, to talk with all of you today about enabling energy access for people who are living off the grid. And as one of the founders of D-Light, I've been working in this field for nearly 10 years now. And in that time, I've just seen a lot of very remarkable changes in this off-grid energy space. And I want to spend some time giving all of you a high-level overview of where I see the market going. And really what I see is an amazing opportunity to make uh, universal energy access a reality within the next 10 to 20 years. Uh, before I get into that, uh, to give you a little bit of context of where I'm coming from, I want to provide a little bit of background about D-Light uh, and how we evolved as a company since we got started. And let me see if I can take the slide here. There we go. Uh, so what really initially inspired us to start D-Light was this. We started the company with a passion to eliminate the kerosene lantern, which is still the primary source of light for well over a billion people in the world. And my business partner, Sam, lived in a village in Benin without electricity for four years, and he experienced firsthand what it's like to live with a kerosene lantern. It's dim, it's polluting, it's hazardous, and actually it's quite expensive. People can spend 10 or 15% of their income on kerosene for light. And this issue really came to a head for Sam when his neighbor's son burned in a kerosene fire. And the boy survived, but he lay on a mat in pain, unable to walk for six months as his burns healed. It really just seemed an injustice to Sam that with innovations in solar and LED technology, with satellites in the sky, smartphones in people's pockets, that nearly a fourth of the world's population would be still burning kerosene for light. Uh, so that's what inspired us to start D-Light, really with a goal to replace the kerosene lantern with solar-powered solutions that were affordable and could beat kerosene when put head-to-head -head in a competitive marketplace. And here's a picture of these same students studying with one of our solar lights. And this particular light costs less than $10, which is less than two months of kerosene cost. So as you can see from this picture, better lighting enables opportunity. Uh, enables the opportunity for students to study for more hours, the opportunity for families to save money by not having to buy kerosene every day, and the opportunity for people to have more productive hours in the day and to earn more income. We've sold over 6 million lights since we founded the company, and that has had dramatic impacts on the quality of life for our customers. But we also found that as customers had the chance to experience the benefits of using quality solar lighting products, lighting was really just a first step, and they had a desire for much more. So we next came out with mobile phone charging solutions, and that was followed by small-scale solar home systems that could run multiple lights, charge phones, uh, power devices like radios, and we're continuing to innovate up this energy access ladder to provide our customers with an experience closer and closer to what grid power can offer. And we believe that with the increasing market acceptance and market penetration of these smaller scale solar lighting solutions, as well as the really amazing um, innovation and in technology in solar and energy efficiency, the demand for more comprehensive and higher power energy solutions is just going to continue to accelerate. We've also heard from other companies who are active in this space that the entry-level solar lanterns really spur adoption for these higher power systems. And this is a quote from the COO of Off-Grid Electric, which is a market leader in the solar home system space in East Africa, where solar lanterns are starting to gain large-scale market penetration. And she says, we have found it much easier to penetrate markets where customers have already had a positive experience with solar products is they have already built trust in solar technology and there are much higher levels of demand. So it's going to be interesting to hear Gaurav's and Harold's perspective on this since their companies focus on these solar systems products. 
certainly from D-Light's experience in the market, we've seen that the demand for these solar home systems and higher power devices are very much driven by the demand created through the establishment of a market of these smaller scale solutions. So at this point, I want to take a step back, uh, not talk about D-Light, but just step back and think about the off-grid energy sector as a whole and share with you about why I believe that there's this amazing opportunity today to provide energy access for everybody through renewable, decentralized, and market-based solutions. And first of all, when we think about energy, what we've really come to conclude is that power is fundamental to the quality of human life. The greater a country's electricity consumption, the greater the well-being of its people. And uh, we have some data to, to back this up. The Human Development Index is a widely used measure of well-being that includes life expectancy, literacy, education, and standard of living. And to start with, we pick Norway on one end of the spectrum and Zambia on the other. And you can see on the x-axis, we've mapped electricity consumption per person per year. And on the other, uh, we've measured the well-being using the HDI score. And as you start populating this with other countries and other data, some really interesting patterns start to emerge. And as you can see here, it really doesn't take much energy access to drive a significant change. When annual energy consumption rises from zero to just a few thousand kilowatt hours, basically enough power to run a few lights, charge mobile phones, run a radio, fan, or TV, you start to see huge gains in a person's quality of life. But the question arises, if the benefits are so obvious, why is it that so many people in 2014 live and work like this? And to answer this question, it's important to understand the underlying drivers and where is this demand supply gap for energy today and where is it likely to be in the future? So on the demand side, there are 2 billion people that don't have access to reliable electricity. About half of that number uh, have no electricity at all and the other half are technically connected to the grid but they just can't count on it when they need it. And experts say that we need to build nearly a thousand terawatt hours of generation capacity to supply power for the billion people who don't have an electric connection. And this doesn't even include the billion people who have an unreliable connection. It's important also to understand where the demand is concentrated. The fact is that 85% of the energy impoverished live in rural areas. And with population growth, Migration to urban areas is really unlikely to change the, the number of underserved in rural areas. And really, people in rural locations, they have the same desire for the benefits of access to energy that their urban or peri-urban counterparts do, but their location means that they have to go to extremes to get power. They need to earn a living or study, but their only options are dangerous, expensive, and fundamentally unsustainable. Now, if we take a look at a global perspective of energy consumption, a historic shift has happened recently, where for the first time in modern history, developing countries have passed developed countries or OECD countries in energy use. And it's not going to go back to the way it used to be either. This trend is actually just going to accelerate, um, as you can see in this, this graph here. So what is energy demand likely to look like in the future? Well, the planet is going to be home to more than 8 billion people within the next 15 years. OECD countries have the largest economies today, but non-OECD countries like China, India, Nigeria, that's where the action is going to be in these energy markets. Now, what about the supply side? Universal energy access is really, it's not just a good intention, it's a global imperative. It's not if, but how do we create and deliver the roughly 1,000 terawatt hours of additional generating capacity or more that we need to build to meet the unmet demand? And to do that, we really should consider a wide range of approaches, including fossil fuels and including centralized power plants and grid distribution. 
as means to combat energy poverty. So first, I just want to consider fossil fuels, which is the default energy resource. And fossil fuels have a lot to offer. Kerosene, diesel, coal, these all have established distribution systems and a broad consumer base. A thousand terawatt hours is equivalent of about 150 to 200 average sized coal-fired power plants. And this is the approach China's taken. I actually lived there for several years, and I can tell you there's plenty of electricity, but the skylines look like this. So if clean renewable energy is able to deliver access at a similar cost as fossil fuels, then these renewable resources should be prioritized as a key part of the solution to deliver energy access. And setting aside the fuel used for power generation, centralized power also requires transmission grids and distribution systems. Centralized generation and transmission grids are a great solution for high population density and short transmission distance markets. In fact, with 60% of people expected to live in a city by 2030, grids are an essential part of the future of energy for high density areas. But the economics really don't work in these low density, long distance situations. Rural grid extension can cost $10,000 to $20,000 per kilometer, and losses can run 15 to 25%. So centralized power production, grid distribution, long distance transmission, these are simply not cost effective solutions for rural areas. And any practical solution to deliver energy access to these lower density rural populations cost effectively has to include smaller scale generation and limited, if any, transmission. And what about customers? What D-Light works with a lot of customers in these rural areas, and what are they telling us about what they want uh, in terms of energy access? And what we hear from our customers in these rural areas is that they want to save money on energy. Um, they don't like the solutions they're using today. They want quality solutions that they can trust. And they want control. They want control over their lives, uh, and especially more control over their income and their expenses. So they really appreciate small-scale, reliable solutions that they can control. Our customers are savvy, they're demanding, and they're selective. They're willing to invest in energy. They're willing to invest in upgrading their energy, provided the products and services perform as promised. So we really see this massive problem of supplying this unmet energy demand as an incredible opportunity. The developing world is a blank slate to some degree. We're, we're not stuck with a huge investment in infrastructure, and we don't have to try and scale solutions that we know don't work or that we know are environmentally unsustainable. The performance of solar power generation, energy storage, energy efficient appliances, all of these technologies are making huge strides, while at the same time costs are declining. And we believe this is making universal energy access within our lifetimes possible for the first time. So we really believe that the world is facing a unique moment in history to deliver universal energy access and power for all. At the same time, the proliferation of affordable renewable technologies has created a viable marketplace for energy access products. Space of the pyramid customers have proven in large numbers that they can and they will pay market prices for modern power, power solutions that they can control. And we believe that by leveraging private enterprise and customer choice, we can leapfrog electrical grids and rapidly accelerate energy access for those living off the grid with affordable, renewable, and decentralized energy solutions. Thanks very much. With that, I'll turn it over to Gaurav from One Degree Solar. And apologies for the technical that got me booted. Hopefully, didn't cause too much of a hassle for everybody. Thanks, Ned. That's great. And and uh, I I um, I'm I'm uh, impressed by how restrained you were to talk about the D-Light story and to the extent that you could. And and we appreciate sort of the the foundational introduction to the story. And as you mentioned, Gaurav's One Degree Solar 
is occupying a space along this energy ladder that is a bit up from your entry level products and in a sense is competing with the light products at the higher end, but has a bit of a different business model. So Gaurav, um, why don't you tell us a bit about One Degree and your view of the market at that level. Sure. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Gaurav Manchanda. Uh, Russell, thank you for the kind introduction earlier and uh, Ned for the, the overall context of, I think, energy poverty and energy access as a whole. And uh, to be honest, I, I would like to, um, of course, highlight what One Degree is doing, but really talk more about how the market is evolving and how uh, companies like uh, like Be Light, like One Degree, and, and the others uh, in the space are really also growing to uh, to meet the evolving needs of the market. So I'll uh, I'll try to uh, maintain restraint as well. <laughs> So just to show uh, a bit more uh, about the, the context, um, I think what, what Ned was talking about with energy poverty uh, really touches on the, the energy ladder that's been referenced as well. And taking a, a look at a standard energy ladder, we're, we're talking about uh, not only rural and, uh, and peri-urban consumers, but also uh, ur uh, people in urban areas without reliable electricity access. Uh, there are many people who are um, a bit easier to reach and, and, and closer to city centers that really uh, that we've experienced that do have blackouts for between three and five or even more uh, nights per week, uh, which represents a market opportunity. And also, uh, I think when you're looking at the um, at the you know, energy poverty issue and this, this ladder, it doesn't include uh, public lighting and and what people are using when they can't afford any electricity at home uh, or any, any any part of that ladder at all. And uh, just to get a bit, a bit of background for uh, for how I got involved with the with the space, uh, I, I did spend, a, a, as Russell mentioned earlier, a number of years working for the Ministry of Health in uh, in Liberia. This was at a time uh, when Liberia's grid access uh, was close to zero percent uh, shortly after the war, and I was responsible for leading the uh, renewable energy initiatives for all of the off-grid um, clinics, which were uh, virtually all of them at the time. So this was uh, several years ago now, and uh, before uh, LED lights were as efficient as they are, before solar panels were as efficient as they are today. And we, uh, for, for that reason, we were, and, and due to the application as well, we were looking to power centrifuges and microscopes and vaccine refrigerators and things that you would typically expect in, uh, in remote and rural um, health clinics. Uh, for that reason, we were looking uh, and forced to use much larger systems than you're looking at today. So um, this is an example of, a, of an installation um, that was for vaccine refrigerators and uh, a number of other uh, equipment within the within the facility. And what it really came down to was, uh, at least from the, the midwife and, and nurse perspective, the main use or the main benefit of uh, of this energy source was not for the refrigerators since you know supply chain for vaccines is also uh, a challenge on its own but it was for emergency lighting at night so people who get in car accidents or emergency deliveries after dark childbirth for example uh, after dark um, we essentially saw you know patients either buying kerosene or candles or or fuel for the, for the diesel generator um, patients spending money out of pocket for uh, for those resources or the community health workers and midwives uh, sending their own money, and uh, it was just really causing some um, some major negative implications on the sector. And one of the other, uh, I think Ned, Ned showed a nice uh, paved road in the in the, in the rural area earlier. Uh, but when those when those roads get wet, they turn into into this. And this is uh, representing another challenge of the larger. Uh, the larger systems. Uh, it is much harder to distribute. Um, it requires very, uh, I would say, very advanced um, installation and maintenance and spare parts and a lot of other uh, factors that go into the much larger systems to the point where, um, in response to the feedback from the nurses, we were starting to look into uh, much more portable solutions, and that was the original um, the original reasoning for, for starting One Degree was to look into more portable solutions that could provide basic lighting and phone charging for healthcare workers. And this was, I'll wait for that slide to load, and this was back at a time when, and, and bringing in the, the overall um, market as a whole, I think this is, how, this is a, kind of a before and after view of how products have evolved and how the, the market has evolved as well, where 
uh, back in 2005, 2007, and uh, several years ago, uh, this, even the, the lanterns themselves were much larger, much less efficient. Uh, they were actually a bit costlier as well, and uh, also single feature. So it was primarily um, the, in the top left these um, older lanterns, only for uh, for basic lighting, basic low quality lighting. And we're seeing as uh, all the companies in the space continue to grow that these products are becoming more efficient, uh, much cheaper, and much easier to distribute. And more importantly, or as importantly, I think, uh, require very little maintenance. And as time has as time has gone on, um, I think as as Ned was touching on earlier, we've I think we've all noticed a uh, an evolution in consumer demand as well. So while while these sort of solutions do certainly address the uh, energy poverty issue, in particular with lighting, um, what we've what we've heard throughout the years. And what we've heard from those nurses and midwives, for example, in our initial projects years ago is that um, they were very happy with the lighting solution and they could do their job easier. But when they brought the product home, uh, their, their neighbors, the school teachers or the shop owners or anyone else in the community started asking for where they could buy the product. And when we started asking why they wanted to buy uh, a basic lighting solution, um, we started hearing questions about, can this basic lantern also power a television? And I think we're all uh, we're all here. Everyone in the industry now is really looking kind of up the ladder uh, a bit more to what can power these solutions. And um, regarding demand generation, it's really a matter of um, making these products aspirational. And aspiration mean, in a lot of these communities uh, typically means uh, it's associated with status, and status is associated, me, associated with uh, with television. So even if the, the financing isn't available to buy the TV, just having a, a power source that can power the TV is uh, is, is desired. So this was, uh, as Russell mentioned, and I'll just skip over this quickly, but we did start by focusing on the healthcare sector and public sector exclusively. And as the as the uh, again as the nurses um, kept telling us, there was demand elsewhere, not just for healthcare applications, but for larger systems that could uh, be more a bit more multifunctional. So we looked with our, our first flagship product to create what we call a, a Pico a microsolar home system, which is multifunction in nature, so it powers anything from a basic smart uh, or basic phone up to smartphones and tablets, uh, locally available radios, and uh, even uh, low power 12 volt television. And taking a closer look at this, I'm, I'm showing how, the, in this picture, how the, the light bulb looks. Uh, and this is a, has been a big demand, demand driver for us, particularly in Kenya, where a lot of the, uh, the feedback that we're getting in, in rural areas is that the, the lights are extremely bright and look just like what, the, what their cousins have in the city. And I, I highlight that because it, it does show that there is aspiration and there is demand to be on grid and to live like um, the, the, the wealthier um, the wealthier folks do in more urban uh, higher income areas and regarding that population so this is a, a slide with data from um, from Boston consulting group and over 10,000 surveys across Africa or interviews across Africa and I want to point out uh, or highlight that, that customer group uh, a bit more and what they're looking to spend their money on. And if we can really break it down, it, it's consumer devices where the mobile electronics, the home appliances, and electronics uh, for the home are all things that are really in demand. This is not only within the energy access uh, scheme or, or realm, but uh, really just for, for as consumer demand grows and as the middle class grows, that demand uh, does trickle down as well. And more importantly, these are uh, the, the three uh, mobile home appliances and electronics are all uh, categories that we can, we can actually power with, um, with the systems that are coming onto the market at this time. And the industry has uh, certainly kept up, I, I think kept up and helped to generate the demand as well, where uh, looking back to um, the, the, the era of the, the vintage lanterns that I was showing on a previous slide, the, the 
the solutions that are on the market, it, it's, I think, been a chicken and egg situation, but as LEDs have become more efficient and the power drain and power requirements have come down substantially, uh, we, the, the industry manufacturers have been able to, to innovate and, and create new products uh, at a lower, at a lower cost. And what we've seen, I think, in the last 15 or 20 years is where customers essentially feel that the the very aspirational products are within reach, and looking just uh, skipping over some of these steps, but um, I think a lot of us remember days when uh, solar solar lanterns were only provided uh, through NGO donations or through um, you know through through donor agencies and things of that nature, and a handful of uh, importers and exporters got involved. Um, Primarily selling lower cost, uh, lower quality lanterns with very limited end user contact and very limited warranty service or after sales support. And as a handful of brands have uh, continued to to grow and and really um, make a name for themselves, that that comes with uh, with brand building and and improving customer loyalty around that brand. So it's more than just uh, energy energy access, but it's uh, it's creating that, that more consumer-driven approach where now a number of, I mean, I would say the vast majority of, of the reputable um, manufacturers in this space are now providing uh, a high-quality customer service, um, efficient warranty processes, uh, everyone's able to, to monitor where their products are in the market, and the, the, the latest trend now and what's really uh, making waves in the industry these days is uh, with pay as you, either pay as you go financing uh, for uh, for end users or using uh, local banks or local um, borrowing clubs to to find ways to make the mo- most aspirational products even easier to to afford. And I, I showed this slide because when we're talking about aspiration and and brands that we want to emulate, we have to make sure that the products are. Um, seen in a, in a certain light, so we, we cannot position uh, our brand or products uh, as an industry to, to be targeting only the, the lowest income or the, the poorest of the poor, and uh, a number of brands, including One Degree, are uh, now you know, paying a lot of attention to our packaging, to, to the design of the product, and usability, and that, has, that sort of design and, and usability has to be Considered when um, when thinking about after sales and customer service as well, and as this slide as the slide shows, uh, there's a a big reason why Toyota is the most desired brand uh, of, of automobile in Africa, and this is a, a brand that we also want to emulate, where uh, the the spare parts are easy to access, uh, local technicians can actually make the repairs without any any advanced training, and it's known for durability. So I speak with a number of folks in the industry about how we have to combine, you know, world-class design with the emerging market practicality, essentially, where uh, as as um, all the hardware and uh, components become more efficient and um, cutting-edge batteries come out and, and um, all of these uh, new features are possible, we have to make sure that the support system is, is in place. And we, at least with our first flagship product, Try to really utilize the existing ecosystem for um, making sure that customer service is existing. Because it's, um, you know, it's, it's a grow- I would say it's still a growing industry with um, proven track records and, and proven companies. Uh, but the the customer experience has to be thought through um, end to end. And this is this is also considered and, and near the top of that energy ladder I was showing. The customer interaction is also is also very critical. So. Um, I, I can speak on behalf of a number of companies in the space and say that we're all focusing much more on um, on customer service as well. And uh, one degree and others now do have um, SMS tools and uh, ability to communicate with customers remotely. So that means we can collect usage data. We can um, see how the products are working. We can uh, whether by um, typing into the product itself or uh, or asking uh, asking customers, uh, we can get very good market feedback at a much lower cost than making uh, trips to rural areas on a regular basis, and then preventative maintenance tips, for example. So when it's, uh, for example, when it's rainy season 
or or winter or uh, a cloudier months in certain certain regions or geographies, we can send up messages to reduce usage, for example. And uh, the I think the bar for customer service, not within the the energy space now, but I think the energy sector is looked at as almost a model for uh, for other industries and other enterprises. Uh, because the the competition in the number of industry a uh, number of players in the industry um, is is forcing this um, this this bar to be quite a bit higher within our space and i'll I'll just ha mention this briefly but um, tapping uh, this is just to talk a bit more about tapping into um, local resources and partners so regarding uh, I'll just mention chloride exit here. Where they are now collecting uh, or able to collect batteries on our, on our behalf, and they have uh, facilities to uh, properly dispose and recycle of these batteries as well. And these are tools that are already uh, existing in these markets and and can be utilized and um, end up building a much better customer experience. And to to dive into our uh, into our work with Coca Cola, um, I, I think in in order to make the the industry really move as well. We have to really show the the consumer uh, or end user benefits in in, pure, in financial terms and in terms that are really universal. And we had a, a six month pilot study or a six month pilot with um, with Coca Cola and Nielsen Research was able to to conduct all of the the interviews and site visits during this process. This is all happening in Kenya. And what we found uh, was a, a great trifecta of uh, a great combination of, um, of results where um, OPEX went down, uh, operating hours went up, and sales, uh, sales increased as well. And making this sort of uh, business case, uh, speaking about um, you know, consumers and, and moving away from the, the, uh, the aid and, and, and donor community and, and um, donor projects and really making large businesses interested in this space. Uh, it really just has to be a business case, and this is one that is is now proven and very easy to understand, and one that we've seen be uh, helpful for the for the industry, not just not just one degree as a whole. If you can show these sort of these sort of figures to a small entrepreneur or micro entrepreneur, um, that sometimes will you know, sleep or spend spend the entire night in their small shop, and it, it does mean a whole lot. And this is a this $130 a month represents a 15% uh, increase in revenue, which is put in very simple terms uh, for a reason. So, as uh, as Ed was mentioning earlier, there really is a uh, a huge opportunity on the horizon, and I think that we're we're taking advantage of now, where there we don't we no longer have to wait for years or potentially even decades in some of these countries for power lines to be built. Um, I know many of us on the line are familiar with how mobile phones really um, were a leap of technology for everything from communication to mobile banking to information collection. Uh, there was a figure that came out yesterday where uh, 400 million Facebook users only access Facebook through their phones. I imagine. A good chunk of those are coming in from off-grid areas, and the, just like a mobile phone enables so much, um, and as mobile phones are getting out there, much more with much higher penetration rates, especially in Kenya, where a number of us operate, um, we have to really think about how those phones stay charged. And that's, uh, and I think the, the mobile phone revolution that's happening really does, uh, in addition to the, the work that the, the true pioneers like Delight uh, have put in. Really do pave the way for uh, other companies to come in and and uh, and meet the demand or fill the demand. And wh while these systems are being decentralized and while consumers are being uh, targeted and and sold to in both urban and and even the most remote areas, um, as I mentioned earlier, the remote monitoring really opens up a whole new. Uh, a whole new opportunity in terms of uh, data collection, in terms of customer service, and, and information gathering. And we have to remember that you know, 10 years ago, as, as a market, we didn't have nearly as much data as we do now. And if, we, if we're all able to share as an industry and, and share uh, between, between ourselves as, uh, as manufacturers and distributors and, uh, and associates and, and partners um, in energy access, then we can really uh, 
all build and implement better products to to address this problem. And I know Hera will get a bit more into uh, what creates demand and um, and their model. So I'll just say that you know, technology has come quite a long way, and the market has um, has as well. And we just have to keep thinking about what's possible um, in the next ten years. Thank you. Thanks, Gaurav. Um, Harold, you um, are taking sort of a multifaceted approach to this market, um, both with a commercial company. You come from an industry um, in Germany focused on solar, significantly different market, significantly different responses. So we're interested in, uh, in your experience and, and what you're seeing in the market as well. Harold? Yes, thank you, Russell, for introduction. Um, good evening, good morning, everybody. As you can hear, I'm a German, so I have a nice German accent. Sorry for this. Um, I would like to show you our work and how we look on this sector. Uh, as Russell mentioned, we, we are a network of a foundation. Stiftung Solar Energy and two business companies, Sun Connect and Sun Transfer. We started 2004 in Ethiopia and we were asked to electrify a whole village with decentralized solar home system, 10,000 inhabitants, 1,100 hearts. And while we did this, we realized that solar home systems could be a really good entry product for off-grid people. So then we started in 2007 um, the pay-to-own end-user finance to, to make solar home system uh, uh, available. In 2008, we started to build a network of uh, solar centers to do maintenance and service. And we are working today in Ethiopia, Kenya, and Philippines. Uh, we will uh, add some countries in the future. Our view on this market. What we found is that people who are living in off-grid areas, they have a dream, and the dream is mainly to be connected with the grid. The reason why this dream is there um, is mainly because they expect full power access, because now they, they have electricity for light, livelihood, communication, entertainment, every, everything what, what they think is necessary to, to have a good life. Um, and what we found on the other side is the reality, if there's a grid, it is expensive, very expensive. And if you are connected, the grid is not reliable. But in most areas of the world, in these de developing countries, the grid never will come. On the other side, we have a technical alternative. These are solar-driven off-grid solutions. Uh, unfortunately, the image right now is for, for different reasons that these solar products are more a bit like the first aid. Uh, but if you really want to have power, then you need a grid or you need to, to buy a diesel generator or whatever. So that's a bit um, challenging for us in our work to explain people, no, no, it's, it's not, not just for first solar aid. It's really um, possible to cover all your needs and to provide you what the grid uh, promises but doesn't deliver to you. The, and this is full power access for light, livelihood, communication, entertainment. And in difference to the grid, the off-grid solutions are affordable and reliable. What we learned from our work is that the philosophy should be if you are off the grid, that this is not a problem. You can get full power access, including our end-user finance and including local maintenance and service. This is our philosophy and, and our approach. And you see some customers in these pictures uh, on the left above is in Ethiopia, on, um, on the right side in Kenya. So these are off-grid living so-called 
poor people. What we found in our work, our in our experience is that there are we call it the five big A of the off grid electrification. First, we learned it is necessary to go to the customer, to go to the, to these people and understand what they really want. And if you ask them, you you realize the typical off grid customer doesn't exist. Some would like to have mobile light, the other one would like to have fixed light or mobile phone charging, another one wants to have power for radio or tape recorder, another one loves to have a TV. So what usually or very often happened is that organizations or companies say, okay, maybe this is what you want, but we think this is not what you need. Uh, what we think it is that you first have to replace your kerosene lantern by light. Um, and my opinion is why we don't treat off-grid people as human people and give them the right to choose what they want and what they can afford. For this, we have to tell them also what solar can do, what is possible with solar energy, energy and what is not possible. Um, what I mentioned already before is that nowadays uh, we have to tell them uh, solar is more than just a first solar aid. It really can cover your needs for livelihood, entertainment, communication, uh, and your whole life. The other, the other thing is if they say, okay, we believe you, um, then the next question is how can we afford it? And what we learned is that poor people are poor, but they, they are not moneyless. They already spend money right now for their energy need, and they have uh, probably more money. The challenge for the solar products is that the investment costs are relatively high, higher than for, for other uh, energies. So now you have three options to make it affordable. One is you can reduce the quality of the solar home systems. Um, uh, we think that's not the best uh, option. The second option is you can reduce the size of the solar home system and just reduce it to a one LED uh, device. But then we lose the, the goal of full power access. So we choose the third option, which does mean we do what everybody knows in, in uh, Europe, US, in everywhere in the world. If you would like to buy something you cannot afford, you go to a bank and you get a credit. And that's why we provide end-user finance so people can afford by monthly payment their uh, full power supply. The next challenge is, uh, even you can afford, how can you get it? And then we learned immediately, um, okay, we need to have a network of rural service stations. And in these rural service stations need to be trained technicians who are able to install, to maintain, to uh, manage all these things. Um, and the fifth, and I think it's the biggest A, is after sales and maintenance. The biggest challenge is not to install and to sell. The biggest challenge is to let it run. Because um, to build customer trust, you need to be there immediately or in short time if the customer has a problem with the system. And this is something which very often doesn't happen because a lot of companies are based in the capital and then they sell the products and they, they go back to the capital uh, or the, the main city around. And if the customer has a problem, <coughs> nobody's there. And that's why for us, after sales and maintenance is um, the key. The, what we do is, or what we did in Ethiopia and Kenya, we built or we started to build a network of rural solar centers. You see the uh, map of Ethiopia on the left and in Kenya on the right. Ethiopia uh, so far has 14 solar centers and Kenya eight, there will be 10 by end of the year. And in these solar centers are working for up to six 
uh, well-trained technicians and they do everything which is related to the 5A. They ask customers what they want. They make it affordable. They make it available. They look for after-sales service and they think how can we improve the rural light by providing more of these um, sustainable off-grid solutions. Just two slides about the products just to give you a short impression. Uh, first, we have our own solar home system with the pay-to-own charge controller, which is a charge controller who provides um, first a lot of information to, to customers, how long can I use the system, what's the battery status and, and all these things. But mainly it is a charge controller who disconnects the system if the customer doesn't pay his monthly fee. If he continues or if he pays, then he gets a code, he puts the code in, and then the system runs uh, until the next payment day. To manage all these things, the Kenyan Sun Transfer Company designed a management software, which we call M-Solar, because you, you can imagine if, if we have 5,000, 10,000, uh, 50,000 customers, and everybody wants to pay at the last day of the month, this is a nightmare. So you can do it via mobile phone payment and immediately you get an SMS with the codes. This is a very good um, Kenyan software. The other thing we are using is a mobile solar home system from Neva, which is uh, really a new, brand new product. We have the exclusivity rights in our countries. And with this you can build your solar home system, your own power supply, like a Lego system. So um, Lego is what, what kids have. You, you buy one component, and if you have more money, then you, you buy other components, and you, you can build up the, the system. The applications we are selling are beside light, also TV, fan. Uh, in, in Philippines, we start with a tablet, and also we provide uh, fridges and, and other things. So everything the customer wants, we would like to supply. Also, we supply mobile solar lanterns uh, because this is part of the full power access that you have a mobile solar lantern for special uh, uses. The next slide is already the conclusion. Um, and this conclusion I would like to use to already as a starter for, for the discussion, because we are three pre presenters and we are working in the same field and our main goal is the same, but we have a bit different approaches, which is very good, first of all, for our customers or the people in off-grid areas, because uh, there has to be a challenge uh, in the competition, what's the best way to cover uh, off-grid people. And I think there's every time a demand for small mobile and plug-and-play and, plug and play products, but also our experience is that off-grid households can afford full off-grid power access if you provide end-user financing with an end-user credit. And off-grid households are able to use these energy products, um, and in our work, these bigger systems are the entry products. And what we learned also is they are they await eagerly a sustainable supply for full off-grid power access. This is what we want to supply. In my understanding, um, there's a neglection of the off-grid industry in the past years that um, we were too much focused on the um, small mobile products. And that's why I think we are now, it's now time to bring the market in a balance and uh, have a look for the bigger solutions as well, because the main goal should be full power supply. And uh, I'm happy that now more and more companies like Sandtransfer, Mobisol, Azuri, B-Box, uh, all these companies are providing the solar home systems and the bigger power supply solutions. Uh, if we do this more, then it becomes true. No grid, no problem. Thank you very much. Thank you, Harald, and thank you, Gaurav and Ned. Um, we've got about 25 minutes now, and we have a whole bunch of questions out there. 
Um, and I note that um, what we're trying to do is talk to an audience which has a broad range of experiences and knowledge of the sector. So we've tried to, as the presenters have tried to target as broad a range as possible, but in so doing, we've missed some things. And so we use the question and answers to try to drill down a bit. There's a whole group of questions asking um, the kind of questions you'd expect from engineers, actually, about payback and economics, about ACDC issues, performance, how do these things perform? We didn't spend a lot of time around this, um, but we can drill down a little bit in the question and answer. I'd like to start <clears throat> just because I think my job is to reflect on the three presenters first. And, and, um, and Harold, you have written uh, publicly and extensively uh, criticism of um, uh, the focus on solar lanterns and products which are down the spectrum from where the products you're selling now are for the most part. Um, and, and you reference the success in Bangladesh where over 10 plus years of a heavily subsidized program, two and a half million people uh, have solar home systems. Um, but I note that in that market, there's still tens of millions of households which do not are not able to participate in that program because it's essentially unaffordable for them. And so you were you were questioning why IFC would get involved in the Bangladesh um, market uh, targeting this area. You said that uh, solar lanterns are just an excuse. Um, as an entry-level product. So I just really have a practical question for you to help us fill in this understanding. Um, how does, in a context where there's 1.2 billion people on the planet that do not have access to basic services, how do we quickly help a significant number of those people get up that first rung of the modern energy ladder if there are not affordable products for that segment of the market, um, and I and I just I, I I know that you just laid out a thesis that said that you'll be able to lend money to customers, but I'm wondering if your customer target is really the bottom end of the market, if your product is available to them, and what how much capital you have to do this with, because we are talking about 1.2 billion people. So my question is absent. A, a incremental process where people are able to grab that first rung on the energy ladder in order to get to the second rung. Um, I, I, how do we achieve scale? For, uh, first of all, I, I don't think that the energy ladder is a good sample because, uh, or I don't think that everybody has to uh, use, to to go the or to use the energy ladder starting from the first step. A lot of people already are able to, to use the third, fourth, or fifth step. And the second is um, what we are talking about. We are talking about full power access or not. Because if we are talking about 1.2 billion people with no electricity, then and we, we say, okay, we need electricity for better livelihood and better uh, income and all these things, then we really talk about more than just providing a, a solar lantern. And what we found, and what we can see in Bangladesh, and by the way, this program nowadays is not heavily subsidized, um, but what well, we see in our work, and in India and, and uh, in other countries as well, um, solar home system can do this. Solar home system um, are affordable if you provide a loan. And the challenge is not um, is not that customers don't want or are not able to pay or don't understand. The challenge is that. Um, the, the finance for this industry is too too small, and you, you see what what's possible in Bangladesh. If money is not really a problem, then it it really uh, it increases significantly. They they are installing sixty thousand solar homes. Six. Zero, so where would the money come from? Per month. From the <clears throat> Carl, where, yeah? where where would where would the money come from that you're talking about? For for. For us in Ethiopia and in Kenya, we were we were looking for a lot of uh, investors, but uh, these investors 
um, are more infected by the NGO world and they say, oh, Africa is not reliable and we cannot invest in Africa and, and so on. And that's why we um, are looking for entrepreneurial uh, investors. We, we found them in Germany and uh, in other European countries and also we invite other people to provide this money. Um, again, the main question is, what is our goal? If our goal is to, to replace kerosene lamps by solar lanterns, okay, that, this can be one goal. But my goal is that all people living in Austrian areas have a full power supply, that their dream become true and reality, that they have really power access and full power sure. access. The, the other thing are, we, all, we, all share, we all share that goal, all the presenters, okay. all the panelists do. Um, I'll just ask how many people you've been able to reach with this model. Finally, 1.2 billion should be reached. You, how many people have you been it's able a, to reach with this model? It's a, it's a, yeah, for the moment, we reach more than 1 million with this, uh, system, with this approach. But the, the question is more, um, can, can we attract more investors? to bring money in this sector. And as you know better than me, um, a lot of money is going to the small mobile uh, products and really less money to the solar home systems industry. And that's a question for IFC, what IFC can do and change the policy of IFC in the future, um, that people really have a full power access. So, so I'll, I'll just answer your question, and then we'll move to the other questions. Um, IFC is a bank that operates on commercial principles, as does the rest of the multi-trillion dollar financial services industry. And so if we are going to mobilize that money into this sector, it has to be proven, and the credits have to be viewed as feasible and viable. And that is the reality we live in. And that is why, to answer your question, uh, some money is now starting to flow to those companies that have been able to be successful selling according to their business model. And that is why, as those companies evolve into more complex, larger systems, and the consumers have been, uh, have been developed and have comfort with solar, and they stopped hemorrhaging money to pay for kerosene, and they have aspirational goals because they now see it's reachable for them. That's why they're able to grow these businesses and get capital. And, and that's what I view. That, that's what I see is happening in the market. And that's really the reality of the financial markets, which is why I'm pressing for a very practical view of this. Nobody wants as an end game for a solar lantern to be the end. The solar lantern is simply a step up the ladder. And we can all take different approaches to this. We can aim high, or we can aim to get high through an incremental process, which is practical and reflects the realities of technology in the market today, and that's what we're seeing. That's the evolution. If you look at actual numbers sold, what companies are doing well, it's those that are following that, that model, and what companies are actually reaching people, it's people that are finding a niche and, and able to get financing to reach that niche and do it, and, and that's why it's exciting what's going on in this market, is it is happening. Uh, first, first of all, I'm really uh, glad that I have seen now more and more is, uh, also thinking about uh, real power supply for off-grid people and starting to invest in this. The other thing is, again, I don't think the energy that we have, we should talk or we should tell these people in off-grid areas in an ideo ideologic way that they have to start the so-called energy ladder every time beginning with the first step. Um, what if they can afford and want to have other type of products? Um, why we don't provide this and sell this and mm -hmm. supply this? That's my, that's my question and that's why I'm really happy that the hype of solar lanterns is coming to an end. I don't say that solar lanterns have not an influence and they are good, that's, that's everything agreed. But the hype, so it's now, I'm really happy that IFC and other organizations and more and more companies now are really interested in a full power access. Uh, and now it becomes a balance, more and more. Not enough yet, but 
I hope with uh, a lot of investors yeah. like IRC, we can do it. So there's a couple of categories of questions that I'm identifying from the audience, and, and, and one of them is, a, is, a, is, a, is related to what Harold and I have been talking about just now, which is essentially questions about what it will take to scale, um, how, what is needed to realize the power for all vision. Um, another person asked, what is the barrier to widespread adoption? Is it really a question of affordability? Is it a question of building distribution? Um, let me ask Ned if he'll react on this because uh, the, the Power for All presentation was his context, but also because he is the company that is actually getting some scale. So, so Ned, you want to you want to react on that? Yeah, that'd be great. And I'll I'll just react a little bit to this last uh, back and forth because um, I do think, you know, Russell, as you articulated, we share the same end goal. And you know, Delight, just to give some context as to scale, uh, we've enabled we've reached over 36 million people uh, with our products. And about roughly 10% of those are finance systems. So we, we have a good perspective on both the systems products and the solar lanterns products. And, uh, you know, something that's clear to me is that many customers are not able to afford um, solar home systems up front. It does target a, a, a higher income Band within the population, but as financing mechanisms are getting and financing paygo technologies are innovating, it's pushing sort of down into lower income families. But there's still a lot of people who really just can't afford a solar home system. So solar lanterns are an important stepping stone for that for them. Of course, some people will jump right to a system, but it's it's really not our view at all that lanterns are somehow first aid or that they're telling customers that they're less than human or anything like that. I mean, we're really, we offer an array of products to customers and they're our boss at the end of the day. They tell us what they want and we listen to them and we innovate and are providing products to respond to, to their needs. And we think, uh, I, I completely agree that it's exciting that things are moving towards higher power systems and that um, as, as a technology and market are evolving, it's opening up um, lots more opportunities, but I, I just wanted to uh, kind of lay out how I thought about solar lanterns in the market. I think they're very important, and they're going to be they're going to continue to be an important solution for a lot of people. Just like with transportation, not everyone can jump to a car immediately. Some people are going to buy a bicycle, and some people are going to buy a motorcycle, and those are good technologies also, uh, and are going to be an important part of the overall uh, framework. So. In terms of what are the things that are going to be needed to really unlock the market to provide energy access for all. So part of this, um, in my view, it, there, there is the financing component. And I think, um, you know, to reach um, a billion, over a billion people with financed um, products, it's a huge amount of working capital to put out there into the market. And uh, there's going to need to be a lot more proof in the market at even larger scale that these business models work. Uh, and to unlock really hundreds of millions or billions of dollars in capital to um, to enable the market to, to move. I think in addition to that, there's policy uh, changes that, that may need to happen. And it, it's very country specific, but uh, in many of these uh, countries where we operate, our technologies are not competing on a level playing field with kerosene or diesel or other fuel technologies. Oftentimes, these other fuels are subsidized, where whereas our products are taxed. But we fundamentally believe that if there's a level playing field in the market through policy, um, that's going to th – these technologies will win. And if they're not um, – if not today, then within several years, the technology is going to be at a place where um, uh, where they can just completely leapfrog these kinds of fuel-based technologies in these areas. And we think, in fact, today, um, when put head-to-head -head in the marketplace competitively, solar wins. Thanks, Ned. So, so we're, we're, we have an audience of mostly engineers, and so there's been a whole bunch of technical questions coming at us, and, and um, uh, we maybe glossed over this because there's only so much we can talk about. Um, I, I, Gaurav, I, I'm wondering if what you can do is reply around the general notion of the direction that the technology has gone, and, and Harold and, and Ned could, could fill in uh, missing pieces, but um, I see a lot of the questions are about how much wattage now is given, how much battery hours, and, and I think one of the principles that maybe is being 
lost here is that with solar systems, the key is to think about services being delivered. And just as important as the efficiency of the solar panel and the power of the battery, both of which technologies are vastly improving, is the efficiency of the service delivery unit, the appliance, whether it's a light, a TV, a fan, uh, a cell phone. And, and so, Gaurav, do you want to talk a little bit about the technical dimensions, how that's changed, how that's enabled some things to happen now, um, and, and, and how we think about this in the sector? Sure. Thanks, Russell. Um, so I think as I touched on a bit in the presentation, in, when I first got involved with this work, there were only, I think only CFL lights that were commonly available or used, more easily available. So in terms of uh, efficiency, in more recent terms, we started out with a two, two and a half watt uh, LED bulb about a year and a half ago when we launched with this latest product. And now we have one that's just about one watt and even brighter. So I mean, the, the rate of, uh, of efficiency improvements is really uh, <laughs> impressive and the, the costs are staying more or less the same. So I think we're all able to, as you said, I think we're all able to, to use more efficient products and it's not necessarily about the size of the battery or the, and I'm happy to comment on that in just a second, but it's not about the actual tech specs, it's about the output or the application. So we can provide, you know, you can easily provide over 100 lumens with one with one watt now, and that wasn't even close to the case five years ago. Um, so regarding, I mean, panel efficiency, I think most of us are looking at around, well, between 15 and 17 percent for the solar panel efficiency. Um, I think, in addition to the battery battery capacity, um, we're also looking in as an industry looking into different battery technologies. So there's of course, lithium ion, there's lead acid, um, different varieties of, of that. Uh, lithium iron phosphate as well is uh, making strides, and it, it really depends on on your target market. And um, as, as I think as Ned and Harold were mentioning, you know, there, there is definitely a need for different technologies in different contexts and different customer segments. So, uh, I mean, even country to country, we've seen certain people actually prefer a heavier lead acid battery because uh, it feels more durable and uh, more powerful than a equally powerful um, lithium equivalent. So it, it's, um, you know, there are always always exceptions and um, and considerations to be to be had. Um, in our product right now, we have uh, a six six watt solar panel, uh, a seven amp hour battery. Um, that's that's what we've had for, uh, and um, there are four 12 volt outputs on the back for the the DC lighting. And the, the draw is quite low. I mean, the, the, the light bulbs that we're using are standard Edison uh, E27 uh, bulbs, and those are getting more efficient um, as, as days go on. I think as an industry, you know, we're we're all looking more into. Uh, I, I think the, the lower cost, and so we to echo what Ned was saying, we can't forget the lower cost and likely lower margin um, lantern or um, more portable solution space, and those are those sort of lanterns are getting, uh, fortunately, cheaper and cheaper and, and more efficient um, by the day. And I think the real innovation is happening with the the, the monitoring and with the um, the usability and the, and the, the design. You know, solar is not a new industry, and it's not a new concept uh, even in these markets. It's just that the products are getting more approachable and intuitive, and easier to maintain, and the quality is. Is, is finally there, so I think it's it, it's much more than just the specs. Uh, I'm, I'm not an engineer, but I definitely appreciate all the questions. I'm happy to take any more technical ones offline. So on that point about on offline and the timing, uh, we're scheduled to end this in about three minutes. We're going to extend it for about ten if the panelists can all stay. But then again, the the the, the question and answers uh, can remain up for a bit longer than that. If the panelists can maybe weigh in on those um, when we finish this or maybe as we're talking, um, then we, that way we can get some of these questions answered if you're in position to answer them. Um, there's also uh, a few references uh, that I'd like to share. I'm going to try to get them up in a printed version so everyone can see it, but just very quickly, there is a excellent website where a lot of this community uh, communicates with each other called Lumina Net. 
So you can Google Lumina, L-U-M-I-N-A, net, and a lot of the questions transpire um, uh, uh, there around technical questions, um, market questions, that sort of thing. Um, also, uh, if you go to Lighting Global, uh, all one word, lightingglobal.org, um, uh, that's where a lot of the work that ISC does and links to other, other sites are there, including the technical specifications for Lighting Global verified products and a list of um, and, and specifications for the products that have been verified. Some of the questions coming in now. Um, I reflect uh, that, that we're missing some key uh, understanding here on, in some areas. So people are asking uh, things like, um, how exactly are we talking about this transition from lanterns and solar home systems? Are they different providers? Pay-as-you-go systems, this is a big conversation because it's a new dynamic in the market. Let me just say one thing about this to try to clarify these questions. Um, there are a range of products available in the market that are quality verified by Lighting Global. Um, they range in price retail from about eight dollars up to um, multiple up to uh, kits, which are packaged and sold as consumer products that consumers install and service, um, up to maybe two hundred dollars. And the Lighting Global Verification is now expanding up to 100 watt systems. And these are, have been transformative in the market because it has um, allowed standardization of, uh, it gave a touch point for consumers to, to identify quality. And it has a range of different products with a range of different, targeting a range of different market segments that deliver a range of different products. And the, 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 the evolution is continuing now around high-efficiency DC products, TVs, fans, lights, the things that provide service into these systems. And those are being packaged now and sold as kits by the same providers. And the other modification, the other evolution is, is related to what Harold was talking about, which is pay-as-you-go systems, where you have some sort of an embedded chip that allows consumers to access the service of their device by paying a daily, a weekly, or a monthly fee, often if there's mobile money in their countries through mobile money or with some sort of link typically with um, the telecoms industry where you're buying a scratch card, for example, and getting a number that you program into your device and it operates. Um, and this is the way, one of the way that we're creating security behind for borrowers that allows financiers to come to the table because it creates a credit security for lenders, whether they're companies like Harold's or whether they're banks and financial institutions. So this is sort of the spread technologically of what's evolved. We're seeing evolution of LED efficiencies, battery efficiencies, and PV efficiencies that not just has driven down price substantially, but mostly has improved performance hours of operation of batteries, service, amount of light delivered per watt input, um, and, and the amount of power that you're transforming the light rays into. So this is essentially what's been going on technologically. Um, uh, Harold, and, um, and, and have you been looking at some of the questions coming online? Is there any that you want to pick up? Um, there are so many questions, and um, I would like to in, invite all who have a question to send me an email. I think it because it's not it's not possible to uh, to answer immediately and in a, in a very short way all these questions, which, which are <laughs> very very interesting. Um, so my my email address is hs at solar minus federation dot org. Hs at solar-federation.org. You, you also can can see on a web page where we provide a lot of serious information about the industry. This is uh, uh, www.sun-connect-news.org. Again, www.sun-connect-news.org. And uh, you are invited to, to write me and, and ask all your questions, uh, which I will answer them. Um, 
I guess there was another general technical question about AC-DC issues. Um, the uh, issues really relate to these solar systems are DC based and the issues relate to um, while there's a very well developed global market for AC appliances, the market for DC appliances is evolving. We have to first prove that there is a consumer base that has solar power for whom large producers of high quality fans, TVs, these sort of lights uh, would sell into. So this is part of the market development work that we do is, uh, is proving a market, mobilizing manufacturers to make products for that market to make it possible. The interchange between AC and DC becomes most relevant when we're talking really about mini grids and potential future interface integration into a grid. But transforming from AC to DC, for the most part, is not at issue here. These are DC systems. Someone asked about safety issues. Um, from my point of view, I, I don't see safety issues with regard to the solar systems. Uh, anyone on the panel want to reply on that? Am I missing something? Uh, well, I think these are, of, of course, you have to protect your, your system uh, carefully because DC is, uh, it, it's electricity and so we have a lot of uses and resistors um, to protect it, but then it's finally it's a safe uh, then there's no, it's not a dangerous um, technology. D different take in that. Anything you want to add? No, nothing to add to that. These are these are low voltage uh, systems. At least the current kinds of systems that are out there in the market and what what D light provides. So um, there's not really hazard risk if someone were to you know even if they splice the wire or anything like that. It's it's not like uh, putting your finger in the the AC socket. It's a pretty low amount of voltage. Yeah, I think that's across the board, and I would, I would uh, I think highlight the end of life as a potential longer term safety issue or environmental issue, but there are some solutions, and uh, I think responsible manufacturers collecting um, even at the end of life as well. And and then and then someone asked about the benefits beyond economic. What is a little elaboration on health and safety? I think the best thing for me to do there is refer you to paper that Evan Mills has written, where he dug in pretty deep um, to issues around fires, uh, health. He did a meta study that aggregated a lot of other people's work, and then he actually went into hospitals in West Africa and looked at the enrollment rolls and found that. Fires from kerosene had been grossly unreported in the past, and poisoning from children, uh, because much of the kerosene is sold in, for example, Coke bottles, um, as an expensive problem. So there's a lot of lot of data uh, there around that. In and I think I, I think a really um, uh, good impact is uh, time, simply time. So if sun rises at six and uh, uh, sunset is at six in the evening. Um, then at six in the evening, um, there's no life because you don't have light, neither in your house nor outside. So if we provide light uh, inside house or outside with mobile lanterns, whatever, um, then um, communication starts. You can do your homework and your your business in the evening. For example, there, there was a tailor in, in, in Ethiopia, a very poor area, and he told us, since I have the solar home system, I can work in the evening, and I don't need to work during the daytime when the sun is uh, shining very bright, and I, I am more efficient in the evening, and it helps um, our whole family. Just I, I wanted to add on one more thing, actually. Um, it, this is I, I saw some questions come up here about how are solar lanterns really acting as a stepping stone? And this kind of ties into a little bit of what Harold was saying, in that w with the solar lantern products, they typically pay for themselves in between two to four months. So people are already spending money, for instance, let's say on kerosene for lighting. And, and once they get these kinds of products, they don't need to buy that kerosene anymore. And in addition to that cost savings, there's also productivity gains because you can do more when you have more, more lighting. So what we find is that both the cost savings and the productivity gains, people effectively have some more disposable income, uh, and they invest those in many things, where it's you know education or um, you know a broad variety of things that that family chooses to do. But some portion of that 
uh, we find that families really are interested in investing that in increased energy access. Um, and that uh, enables them to save up for another product or a system. Um, and that, that's really one of the ways we see to actually manifest. We actually talk to quite a lot of our customers and find um, that mo- many customers don't just buy one. Uh, they buy one and then they upgrade you know, to a, a, a bigger one or they buy a system. So we find that giving people you know, some access to energy, there's a, this virtuous cycle that happens because of the ability for people to save money and actually earn more income. And that's some of how we've actually seen this, this kind of conceptual ladder framework manifest itself in reality. Let's also remember that uh, it's very, very difficult for someone to set aside um, uh, a month's worth of income to buy something if they don't have confidence in it. And, um, and, and that's why the stepping stone also happens, is if you can buy and get confidence and then actually you realize you've got the power, you actually can think about a TV. You actually can think about a fan. And, and that's another part of the virtuous cycle. It's, it's about confidence. Yeah, Russell, if you don't mind, uh, just to continue on Ned's um, talk about payback, I think there was one question on payback and uh, the ROI for these kiosk owners that I mentioned earlier. So in that, um, in that Nielsen research, it was showing, uh, I think it was 15 U.S. dollars per month spent on, uh, on lighting just for the interior light, not anything on the outside. And the, uh, the $130 uh, increase in sales so uh, if you want to combine those and say about $150 combined net swing, uh, the products uh, typically cost less than $100, U.S. so the payback is quite fast. And the companies that are doing pay-as-you-go systems or what Harl is doing with leasing, they're pegging their payments so it's a level less than the costs avoided from the services that um, are being replaced. So you're getting a higher, higher level of service um, with the health safety benefits, and the, the, the business models that virtually all the companies are using are to make sure that that's at no net additional monthly cost, at least the companies that are getting traction. And um, yeah. I, I would highlight something uh, you, you mentioned, Russell. Uh, sometimes we are on the same line. Um, this is confidence or trust, that, that people, that the customer trusts you as a company, this is uh, the main key, that, that's why we think after sales service is so important uh, to build trust to customers. You have to be there if they have a problem or if they would like to increase the system or, or whatever. Trust is the key. And this you cannot pay or find or, or do with investors or whatever. This is a special attitude, uh, uh, corporate culture, whatever, but trust is the key. Excellent. Thank you, Harold. Um, I uh, have to be respectful of the time, uh, so we're 10 minutes over the original schedule. Um, can, can the panel members, uh, can you um, take a look at some of the questions that are, that are on there? Um, Jana and Holly uh, said that we would be able to access this for another half hour or so. Um, uh, if you have enough time to please take a look and maybe respond on some of these, then the people out there listening uh, can can see the responses of the questions we were not able to get well, to. I, I saw one question from um, Amazon Payme in in one in uh, in Angola just by, by random. Uh, she said uh, we are in Angola in a place where, where rural areas don't have a bank account. I think that's a, that's a question for the pay as you go or pay to own systems. There are different type of ways to pay and. Um, you, you can do this via your mobile bank account, like Mpesa in Kenya, if it exists. But, uh, for example, with our system, you can pay cash in our solar system, in, uh, sorry, in our solar center. So the customer comes to our rural solar center, to our technicians, and he pays cash. So this system of pay as, pay to own, uh, or pay as you go, whatever, um, works with a bank account or with no bank account, it's independent from um, mobile phone or not mobile phone. That's very important to know. Thanks, Harold. That, that is helpful. And, and I think that relates to uh, the Angola question and the question about the Philippines 
are similarly uh, a huge question that I want to close with, which is um, where are these products available and, and how do we access them? And, and I'll say that the, the market is evolving um, stepwise and um, there is a fairly strong presence in India, a strong presence in much of sub-Saharan Africa. Um, there's different companies that are able to get to different places. And um, Gaurav started in West Africa because that's the area he was living in and, and he knew. And, and so um, you can, as I referenced, you can go to the Lighting Global website to see at least the devices up to 10 watts. We will be expanding this over the next year up to a 100-watt system. So that's a nice reference point to quality products and how to reach the manufacturers. The manufacturers are trying to expand. Uh, these companies uh, that are on the panel are trying to expand their footprint to be available other places. Um, it's an evolving industry, and it's not everywhere yet. Um, ISC has a presence in multiple African and South Asian uh, countries where we support the market's development. We're not everywhere yet in this market. So it's evolving. Um, I think you have to try to contact the companies at the global level uh, to see if they have uh, distributors locally in your markets. So, and, and by I the way, think, yes, go ahead. And, no, the, the, the people who are asking from Philippines, uh, where can I buy it? Uh, D-Light is uh, in Philippines. I'm sure you can buy one degree solar in Philippines as well. And of course, SunTransfer is working in Philippines as well. So the Philippines are on the safe side. Yep. Excellent. So thank you, Harold. Thank you, Gaurav. And thank you, Ned, um, Yana, and Holly for organizing this. And most of all, to the participants, don't forget to register to get credit if you want to do that. Thank you, everybody.